Welcome to the World Financial Symposium's Market Spotlight webcast series. Today's conference will start in a moment. The WFS is dedicated to educating technology leaders through webcasts like these and the Growth and Exit Strategies conference series held in London, New York, Silicon Valley, and other tech and financial centers around the world. The speakers and sponsors of these live events read like a who's who of industry leaders. To learn more about our live events for CEOs, owners, and investors, or to access our library of on-demand spotlight webcasts covering markets like IT security, health tech, gaming, and more, please visit WFS.com. And now, let's join today's Market Spotlight webcast. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending where you are today. My name is David Levine with the Quorum Group, and I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm active in the security sector, and prior to joining Quorum, I was a technology CEO and investor in counterintelligence. This webcast is presented by the World Financial Symposium, an organization dedicated to educating technology CEOs. We have an impactful agenda pulled together for you, and my colleague Patrick Cunningham and I will explore the state of data security in today's market. We'll take a look at some of the key drivers affecting the market and how they are shaping both innovation and M&A. Patrick will then provide an overview of transactions and valuations that we are seeing today in the data security market and provide us a view into who some of the top buyers in this space are. We will then hear from some of our panelists at Sophos, NetMail, and Trust Farm about key security sector drivers, innovation, and recommendations that you should consider when building your growth playbook, your growth or, playbook your security or, company. or your security company. Quorum has been active in the security space, and this is a sampling of companies that we've sold going back to some of Symantec's earliest M&A. More recently, we sold Beware to Deny All, and this deal was done because Deny All was looking to expand its growth to broaden their portfolio in Europe and deliver next-generation application security to more customers worldwide in the cloud and through its partner network. We also sold PowerTech to Help Systems at the time, backed by PE firm The Audix Group. PowerTech developed automated security solutions for IBM servers and was led by John Scott, who now serves as the managing director of Quorum's European branch based in Amsterdam. All that to say, we know this space pretty well, and it's particularly exciting today. That excitement is largely driven by the numbers. You are likely aware and monitoring this data on a regular basis. Nonetheless, they help set the stage for what we are seeing in the sector from an M&A standpoint. They tell a poignant story about what is happening in the market today, both at a macro and micro level. We are nearing 20 billion devices that are going to be connected by 2020, and this is expanding the attack points that hackers can use to exploit. Over 9 billion data records have been lost since 2013, and almost 5 million data records are lost or stolen every day. Think about it. It's over 200,000 records every hour. What is interesting about these breaches is that only 4% of the breaches were secure breaches where encryption was used, and in those cases, the data was rendered useless. Cybercrime cost the economy over $450 billion last year. These numbers set the table for what is happening in the data security market, the potential, the changing landscape, and the daunting task of securing critical ideas, data, and infrastructure. No sector in the market today is untouched by digitization, whether government, finance, or healthcare. All companies are becoming digital companies. This is exponentially expanding the attack surface for security breaches from malware, zero-day threats, and ransomware. Whether large or small, no company is immune from the ripple effect of our globalized economy and the types of cybercrime that are pervasive in our hyper-connected world. The largest and most sophisticated companies in the world are being attacked. Whether it is HBO, Deloitte, Equifax, or Uber, data breaches are pervasive and no longer binary. With varying degrees of impact, data breaches can have little impact or take down entire global networks of confidential, sensitive data. Just this week, the sophisticated Triton malware shut down an industrial plant in the Middle East. This is driving companies to react and continue to grow their cybersecurity and data security initiatives to protect their data. Enterprise and governments are no longer safe from hacking, and they must invest to maintain and predict security breaches. With connected devices everywhere, we are seeing the need for software-defined perimeters, mobile security, cloud security, and threat intelligence that is real-time. Without these integrated tools, organizations are naked and vulnerable. The large security companies can't plug all these holes on their own, and this is driving M&A in the market. 
With all this in mind, I'd like to turn the webinar to Patrick Cunningham to tell us about what trends he is observing in the market from an M&A standpoint. Patrick? Thanks, Dave. We start with recent M&A activity in cybersecurity. We're still seeing hints of the supply-side crunch that has been present in the technology sector all year, but certainly less pronounced in the security sector, which is outpacing the market as a whole. Diving deeper into acquisition activity, we see fewer PEs as top acquirers than we normally would. More interestingly, there are also many non-traditional security companies as top buyers, reflecting the increased need for the integration of security into all forms of technology. 2016 saw a number of mega deals in data security, with Symantec taking the top two spots with its acquisitions of Blue Coat and LifeLock, continuing its focus on consumer digital safety and enterprise security. Symantec had purchased Blue Coat from Tomo Bravo, paying over three times what Tomo Bravo had paid for it back in 2015. With its recent acquisition of Barracuda, the first security mega deal of the year, Tomo Bravo may be aiming for a similar story. Further down, we see that although traditional cybersecurity companies aren't necessarily making many acquisitions, they are more than willing to spend for the companies they do pick up. Now, what are these companies basing their valuations on? In the private sector, multiple seem to follow a spectrum, with anti-malware and endpoint security technologies valued relatively highly, while on-site network security tends to receive a lower valuation. In the public sector, we see a similar trend in multiples as far as EV over sales, but security companies are being valued highly as compared to other infrastructure software companies by their EBITDA multiples. This is a classic indicator of a maturing market where profits are valued over market share. Moving on to more M&A deals, we start off with the only PE to make our top buyers by deal volume list, InvestCorp, acquiring the Scandinavian company Corsec for $77 million. InvestCorp plans on bolting on Corsec to SecureLink, acquired back in 2015, in a play at building a pan-European cybersecurity platform. Along with these acquisitions and a recent purchase of physical security company Key Safety back in October, InvestCorp moves deeper into the broader security market in Europe. Back to the strategics, Israeli company Lacoon Mobile Security was picked up by Checkpoint Software Technologies for around $80 million, aiming to build stronger security measures for corporate endpoint devices from a less traditional, more preventative perspective. From our AI market spotlight last month, here's a deal that combines two of Quorum's top 10 disruptive trends, AI enablement and data security. Microsoft continues to strengthen its cybersecurity systems for Windows through the acquisition of Israeli AI-enabled attack investigation specialist Hexadite for a reported $100 million. In the States, Texas-based iSight Partners was acquired by cybersecurity firm FireEye for $200 million at five times revenue. Possibly hoping to turn its fortune from the data breach panic of 2014 and Fox since, this acquisition will help FireEye round out its portfolio of digital defenses. And finally, there's a bit of too little too late. Equifax acquired ID Watchdog only a month before its major data breach discovered in July. Maybe if ID Watchdog and Equifax had completed the merger more quickly, this would have been avoided. Now we go back to Dave with our panelists from Sophos, Netmail, and Trust Farm. Dave? Well, good, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining me this morning for our security panel discussion. Um, I'm excited to, to have all of you here with me and um, look forward to exploring various topics around security and M&A that are, that are going on in the market today. What I'd love to do is uh, just go around the table and have everybody introduce themselves, you know, maybe a brief bio about you and about your company. That would be great. Sean, why don't you kick us off? Uh, sure. So, uh, Sean Muirhead, I work for Stofos in the corporate development function. I've been with Stofos now for nearly three years. And um, uh, I guess my, my primary role is to work with our internal stakeholders and business owners, um, find out what technology they are, are looking for or what marketplaces they are looking to enter, and then go and find some targets to uh, have strategic discussions with. Excellent. Thank you for that. And uh, Phil? Sure. Um, I'm Phil Van Etten. I'm the, uh, currently the CEO of NetMail. I've been there for almost three years. Uh, we sell a unique sales approach to counter malware and ransomware, uh, primarily at the gateway and around email. Excellent. And Alan? Good morning. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, I'm the uh, founder and CEO of, of Trust Farm LLC, uh, based in Vienna, Virginia. 
Uh, we're a company focused on insider threat management from a human behavioral perspective, and we help client companies mitigate their insider threat from a human um, activity standpoint. Prior to that, I built the uh, intellectual property and trade secret protection program at Merck Co., uh, a large pharmaceutical company based in New Jersey. And then prior to that, I was a CIA officer focused on the recruitment of scientists and researchers. So uh, I feel like I'm playing, uh, after 20 years of playing offense, I'm now playing uh, a bit of defense uh, to, to help protect critical assets around industry sectors. Excellent. So thanks for that background, everybody. So what I'd do is just, you know, jump in here and take a look at what the, the macro issues are that you're seeing that are that is driving the security market today. You know, you saw Toma Bravo announce the take private of, of Barracuda. You saw uh, McAfee announce the acquisition of a CASB player. So I'd, I'd like to open it up to conversation around, you know, what, what are the big issues that, that we're seeing right now? in the security sector. Phil, why don't you kick us off? Sure. The obvious big issue is just the landscape is just getting bigger and bigger. There's more e-commerce and more, I mean, everything touches uh, technology and electronics, which just opens more and more ports. Uh, and that is, you know, helping hackers have more vectors to attack. So from a, a macro perspective, I, I think the security space is just going to continue to grow. For obvious reasons, hackers are getting more sophisticated and the landscape is growing. But, I mean, you're going to have some other changes in the marketplace. We have a wait-and-see approach to blockchain. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen there. And we've got some other changes in technology from artificial intelligence to machine learning that we're going to have to, to kind of wait and see what vectors those open as well. Excellent. Thanks. Hey, Sean, I'm curious on your, your views on this. So as, as was already mentioned, the, the stars of the landscape is increasing. The complexity of the attacks are also increasing, but the motivation remains the same, uh, primarily driven by our revenue uh, revenue income. And I wonder how many smaller organizations have a focus on protecting their assets from these types of breaches, or if they are still running around in the dark, uh, believing that the targets are only focused on the the large enterprises. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, mean, you you raised some big points around the, the number of uh, of attack points, I mean, we all see the the number of IoT devices, and the, those are obviously access points to to any network. Alan, what do you think? Yeah, th- thanks. Yeah, you know, I, I echo Sean and Phil's uh, sentiment uh, regarding just the the size uh, of the problem, and, and maybe not the sophistication, but but certainly just the the large landscape that uh, the attack services that companies and entities and organizations are are having to to deal with. I I think one of the largest macro issues that I'm seeing with uh, with client organizations is is just the deconstruction and coordination of all the tools. Uh, I think we went from a uh, a box checking compliance exercise uh, through the purchase of, of security tools and in appliances and devices uh, to, to now really having a, a need to coordinate uh, how those um, how those protective uh, layers actually work together and uh, and and then you know from a macro issue it's, it's it's not enough to buy a box anymore you you know you, the, the big piece that 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 companies and clients are, are struggling with is the whose eyes are actually on the glass and uh, and, and what do we do about it if we do see uh, an issue, how do we respond? And, and so I, I think, you know, the big issue for um, the folks managing the cyber security threat is just having a strategic plan in place and a playbook that when an incident does occur, you know, how quickly can you find it and, and how quickly can you mitigate it and remediate and, and recover from it? So I, I think I think that's the big issue is, is just understanding what you're up against and, and then coming up with a plan to, uh, to manage it. Right. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. And, and you know, all, all of this is – you know, we're seeing all, all these issues are, are driving, um, you know, various pieces of the market and, and, and driving growth. Um, obviously, we're, we're familiar with what's happening from secure, security breach standpoint. I mean, we saw, you know, just recently Uber announced something around um, some a breach that they had last year that's finally getting out there. Uh, I think it's public knowledge about what happened with Yahoo and, and, and their valuation as well. So these security issues are real. and. And, and we, we see it showing up now um, every day. I guess I'm, I'm curious to, as, as, you, as you're looking at your businesses, you know, what, what are the key drivers of growth right now for your businesses at, at a macro level? I'm curious on, on, on your thoughts there, Sean. The key driver at the moment has been our endpoint protection around ransomware. 
again, it seems a, a knee-jerk reaction from a consumer perspective to go and buy a product to solve a point problem instead of looking at the underlying infrastructure, the cause that maybe they could have prevented in, the, in deploying best practices in the first place. Understand. Alan, what about you from your standpoint? You're, you're obviously looking at this from another perspective as you're working with, with companies and, and how to protect their assets. So what are the, what are the key drivers uh, for growth that you're seeing in, in, in your sector? Right, right. You, we, we uh, you know, our, our primary point of contact in, in client organizations is, is the CISO, where we're um, a director responsible for, for information assurance and, and security. And, and, and the, the key driver that, that we're seeing is, is the, the desire to, uh, to move more to a proactive uh, stance versus a reactive. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, events like the ransomware and, uh, and some of the recent uh, headlines that we've seen. Um, have gotten security executives sort of on the back of their heels. You know, they, I, I think from a philosophical perspective, they, they want to be a proactive uh, organization and, and kind of head off in, in fixing underlying causes of a lot of the, the impact and damage that, that's caused by failures and, and controls but uh, and, and move to more of a reactive or a predictive kind of state of mind. But um, the, the reality is they're, they're still seeing struggles within even the reactive uh, space. And then the pressure of public opinion and, and, and more so around stakeholder expectations and the, the board of directors are really driving conversation uh, around the cybersecurity issues uh, as far as the liability and, and how how are we, how are we uh, managing this as an enterprise risk uh, versus a, a tactical or a proactive approach? Yeah, makes sense. Joe, so how about, how about uh, as you look at your business and what are the key drivers of growth that are impacting you? Well, I, you know, I, I would agree that uh, the reactive spending is probably driving uh, about half of that growth. Um, and uh, at, at the end of the day, that the uh, the hacks and uh, in, in most folks know 70 percent of of the hacks uh, are still started with a phishing attack and some sort of uh, double clicking on a link by one of their employees. So that's an uh, ongoing struggle. But going back to trying to understand the underlying causes, for example, uh, the uh, the WannaCry virus in May that was caused by not patching Windows servers, and so. It's more of a, a strategy. The, the other thing that's driving our growth is confidentiality breaches. Um, more and more organizations are aware that they have uh, confidential and sensitive PHI data in their content, whether it's in their files or their email. So we're frequently called on to cleanse that data to make sure it's clean because at the end of the day, if that's exposed, uh, there's more than just a security breach. There's a lot of violations of local law and um some business practices. Got it. Yeah, I think I mean, you know, I, I think those are those are all valid points that, that you all bring up here and 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 you know we, we're seeing some common themes. I'd like to move over to innovation. As we take a macro look at, at the, the security market just year to date, there's been over over a hundred uh, transactions in the sector. I would love to get some input on how you think about innovation within your organizations. Where is it coming from today? What's driving the innovation in the market? And then and then how does that play out from an M&A theme standpoint? Phil, circling back to you. I mean, how do you guys think about innovation, and and um, how do you how do you cultivate that internally? There's always going to be a lot of innovation that's pure reaction to where the market is, and in particular in security where the hackers are getting more sophisticated. I think a lot of, a lot of innovation is coming from the security strategy on how you put uh, a lot of other technologies together to work seamlessly, whether it's a dashboard or more specifically on uh, steps you would take uh, to address uh, an attack or how quickly can you launch your plan. I think the other one we're looking at as well is how much of this can we automate so uh, we're leveraging um, artificial intelligence or analytics to uh, continually refine what bad behavior is so that we can take action. So, you know, we have a, an IDS endpoint that uh, can detect when a, when a potential malware happens, and, and so we need to continually make that better, leveraging some of the tools out there. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we're, we're seeing a, um, a large amount of artificial intelligence and overlaying on security and people are looking for ways to predict with sentiment analysis and really understand 
of what's going on before the, the events happen to prevent things like, like zero day. Alan, uh, what about, you know, from your standpoint, what, what kind of products um, are you seeing being requested from, from the market or from your types of customers? I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that. I appreciate that, uh, Dave. We're seeing a, a good effort to uh, adopt more of a, a program management or, or, or an audit perspective where clients that have had incidents related to cybersecurity, um, we're seeing a, an effort to kind of dissect uh, how that uh, incident uh, occurred and what, you know, what was the underlying gap in the protection that, that allowed uh, allowed something to get in or some sort of damage to, to occur. And, and so a lot of the innovations on the cybersecurity side is, is kind of dissecting the, the anatomy of, of the breaches and, and the loss and, and then coming up with tools to kind of close those gaps in the future. So, so there's an intelligence cycle that we're seeing in the, in the product development and the innovation development in that, you know, unfortunately, Actually, uh, it, it takes someone getting uh, victimized in order to, to find a, a, a cure so that others may not go down that same path. But there are some good analytics that are coming from the dissection of breaches that, that, that are informing tool developments and, and, uh, and other innovations on the cyber side. Uh, great. That unpacking of the events that occur and, and understanding them, you know, we're seeing more tool sets that are coming out uh, on a regular basis as well, and, and so that's, that's critical. You know, I guess, a, you know, a question for, for the group, and uh, feel free to, to jump in there, but, you know, as, as you're looking at companies, as you're seeing companies and, and considering them potentially from, from an M&A standpoint, you know, what, what are the areas that you see them potentially needing to evolve or, or improve as you, as you think about their technology stack or, or things that you see companies trying to solve in the market? Sean? I think on that one, you've got to take it on a case-by-case basis. A lot of the companies I look at are early stage and solving a point problem. And that point problem needs to be solved, but also needs to be part of a larger portfolio. Yeah, the, the, uh, I guess my, my, my only advice to the early stage startups is either look to build your business around more than a point problem, point solution, or realize that you are building a, uh, a piece of somebody else's bigger puzzle and uh, welcome the exit uh, when, it, when it comes around. Yeah, you know, sage advice there, and and uh, you know, as as companies try and figure out product market fit, wherever they're at on the on their evolution, that's that's a really important point. So, what are you what, you know what are you seeing? Where where is it? Do you, you I'm sure you see companies on a regular basis. You know, where do you see companies needing to to evolve or or to improve upon? Yeah, I, I think uh, Sean makes a really great point that. Companies need to recognize in a security startups that they're part of an infrastructure play, that their point solution needs to work with other parts of uh, companies, uh, either cloud strategy or, or on-premise infrastructure, and that it's not just, you know, uh, one thing that, that will uh, secure a network. On the other side, with not talking just about innovation and, and how you sell your product, I, I think uh, – you see uh, uh, startups frequently have a scattered approach to uh, how they execute and probably a, a more focused approach in uh, what they're solving and, and the pain points they are, are trying to solve is probably prudent. Yeah, excellent. And, Alan, any, any thoughts on that? I know, you know, as, as you're working with, with companies or, or looking at companies, I mean, you know, what are, what are areas that you think that, that companies can, uh, can evolve or, or improve upon? Yeah, 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 and, and, and I, I think I think the focus on on, on M and A uh, effort, you know, especially when it, when it relates to due diligence, and, and, and so either whether you're the company acquiring the assets or or you are being acquired, the, the M and A due diligence process seems to focus historically, anyway, on, on the financials, right, and, and, and the, the most immediate uh, intellectual property and, and, uh, and technology. What I've seen companies, client companies, primarily forget about it is the is the product pipeline, and so, you know, an acquisition might might be might occur to pick up a, a suite of patents uh, around a particular product, but there's a, I think there's a much bigger asset to be acquired, and that is the idea. That, that it may not be formally in the pipeline, and so I think companies involved in, in M and A need to need to really understand 
uh, knowledge management and, and figure out ways to capture that knowledge um, so that if you go through the M and A process, yeah, there is the, uh, the the target or the uh, or the acquisition uh, holder. Um, it's important to identify those assets and, and then take steps, obviously, to, to make sure that they get bundled and protected as part of the M and A process. I, I see a lot of companies buy another company for a particular technology, completely forget about the ideas and, and, and other assets that might be in their product pipeline, uh, only to have former employees or people that may not be part of the M&A uh, transition team uh, to take those assets uh, to competitors. So it's important to throw that net around uh, all those assets and identify those assets as, as part of the overall M&A transaction. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. Uh, preventing leakage or, or data movement or IP movement is, is critical in, in an M&A event. I guess, you know, just one more, one more question here and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. If you were counseling, uh, you know, CEOs today in, in, in this sector, you know, what, what advice would you give them, um, in, within today's market? And I just open that up for, uh, throw it out there for, for each of you to comment on. Um, so if it's a small company, uh, startup style, I would say keep your cap table clean and focus on execution. Cap table clean and focus on execution. That's, that's great advice. What else? Well, I, I think uh, the CEO needs to focus also on uh, his market and understanding his market. Um, you know, th- there's a lot of decisions, um, whether you, you raise your next round or you decide to put your company up for sale, and uh, you should understand what your customers are buying from you and why they're buying from you and, and the market size and, and the innovation. And I guess that's all around just pure execution and focus. I like the comment, keep your cap table clean. Uh, you can always clean up your cap table at a later later time, but you're right, it's so much easier to do that. Uh, I, I, w- I would say then if, if you're being real tactical there, you, you'd want to keep your documents clean and your customers and uh, your employee documents, especially the proprietary agreements. And, and so, uh, you know, all that relates to just staying focused on the details. I echo both uh, Sean and Phil's sentiments. I, I think... Uh, yeah, you know, if you walk around an RSA uh, conference or, or some other, you know, large type of security uh, gathering, what strikes me as, as a day-to-day practitioner is the uh, the, the leader follower um, nature of, of companies. So, so it, I, I think the key for for a CEO to, to build a, on a on, to build a solid company is, is really identifying. Uh, the, you know what, what makes them different than their competitors, and, and, and really focusing on uh, that differentiation, so that so that when when ven- when clients are, are, are reviewing um, vendors and suppliers and, and, and options, uh, they they can walk away with the idea of, of of why why your company should be selected over another, and um, and I, it's kind of basic business 101 uh, that we sometimes get lost in. Um, and uh, that sometimes gets lost in, in, in the marketing. But the differentiation, I think, is the key. You know, how are you different? And, uh, and if the CEO kind of focuses that messaging and make sure that that, that culture uh, is is, uh, is maintained, then, then I think uh, totally, you know, obviously benefits have come from that. Great advice from all of you, and, and it's, you know, much easier uh, said than done. I think that execution piece is, is critical to – to building uh, a business that's going to have a, a significant impact in the market. So, um, so thank you all very much for for your insights today. I know we only had a brief time together, but I think it was excellent to you know lay out uh, some of the the driving forces within this market, and and then of course you know give give uh, CEOs something to think about as they're as they're building their playbook here and you know thinking about how to. Uh, position themselves and, and go into business. So, uh, thank you again. And um, with that, um, we'll um, we'll wrap up the panel. Really appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. I'd like to leave you with some ideas to tie all this together and think about your business in the context of mergers and acquisitions. What do the trades for a successful security acquisition look like? First, it is critical to be building a solution that is addressing a real pain point in the market. What problem are you solving for, and are you rapidly getting customer traction? Also, have you built a technology that is aligned with current trends in artificial intelligence, virtualization, and predictive analytics? Furthermore, how do you fit in the current architecture in the market? Is it easy to integrate with all the other security players and analytics providers that are selling and marketing to the same customer base? You also need to be considering your team. 
You have deep subject matter expertise in a given area that will put you in a position to have your company to be considered a thought leader in the market that you are targeting. Build out a strong customer base that is referenceable. You're dealing with protecting mission-critical assets of enterprise and government. So having customers that are seeing a positive impact using your product in their organizations will be beneficial as you build your business, both with other customers and acquirers. And remain laser-focused on understanding the market and your customers so you can continue to differentiate yourself from your competitors and drive value. And last, begin with the end in mind. Today, it is important to be starting and building your business with the expectation that it's going to be sold one day. You'll be far ahead if this mindset is in place from the beginning. Thank you very much for your time today, and if you have questions, please send them to us, and we will respond accordingly. We hope you enjoy today's online symposium. If you have any questions not answered, please submit them to info at wfs.com. We look forward to seeing you at one of our upcoming live events in a city near you. To register for these live events, view upcoming webcast topics, or hear rebroadcast of this or other market spotlight events, please go to WFS.com. Thank you for attending today's webcast.